Hello friends, welcome to another episode of BioNews. Today I have four papers to discuss with you guys. We will begin with a paper by Heer Spink et al. This paper wanted to consider whether SGLT2 inhibitors, which you guys will be familiar with because I take one of them called empagliflozin, SGLT2 inhibitors basically cause you to urinate out a bit of a glucose that you would keep in your bloodstream throughout the rest of the time. There are a new class of uh, anti-diabetic medications created in the last 10 years. Now what's fascinating about these medications is not only do they seem to improve conditions among diabetics, but they specifically, uh, if you guys don't know, in diabetes there's a kind of diabetic, uh, uh, rect uh, basically diabe in diabetes people often develop chronic kidney disease consequent to the diabetes potentially partially because of the glucose in the bloodstream. What's interesting is SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown to dramatically, or at least comparatively, dramatically reduce the progression of chronic kidney disease. But they've only been studied in diabetics so far. So it was unclear to other people whether empagliflozin and similar drugs would be protective for kidney disease among people who only already have chronic kidney disease and don't have diabetes. This study was really fascinating because what they did here was it was a randomized controlled trial of over 4,000 patients with chronic kidney disease. In a 2.5 year follow-up, dapagliflozin, which is another SGLT2 inhibitor, was found to reduce all-cause mortality by 31% over 30%, driven mainly by non-cardiovascular improvements in specifically infections and malignancies like cancer. So this was the first time that SGLT2 inhibitors were shown to improve uh, mortality among people with chronic kidney disease that don't have diabetes. Really fascinating stuff. A second paper by Ding et al. This study is a meta-analysis of eight studies, including 5.7 million participants. They sought to determine whether a biomarker, a proxy va variable, called the triglyceride glucose index could be predictive of atherosclerotic cardiovascular events in those who did not have it at baseline, did not have cardiovascular disease at baseline. They found that what's called the TYG, the triglyceride glucose index, was found to be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease and, ath sorry, for atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. A third paper, also about heart failure, but now not about insulin resistance, but rather about liver disease. Are, is heart failure associated with liver disease? And why might it be, for example? Liver disease is often part of metabolic dysfunction in the body, and cardiovascular disease is also part of that. This interesting study indicated that the, uh, sorry, it was a cross-sectional study of 320 candidates for coronary angiography, which is a kind of uh, scan to determine the level of plaque or worsening cardiovascular disease in the coronary artery. Arteries. So in addition to doing the uh, coronary angiography in this 320 participants, they also gave them ultrasounds of their livers. What they found was that coronary artery, artery disease and severity of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease was uh, linearly related in the cohort, which is very shocking. So it's showing that there is a strong relationship, maybe not a causal one, but an interrelationship between heart disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In the uh, final, final paper today by Arias et al. Now, I just want you guys to understand, I don't completely agree with the, uh, I mean, I don't buy in completely to the hypothesis in this paper, but I found it to be a very fascinating and informative paper, and I'll tell you guys a little bit about what I learned from it. So this is a review paper positing that part of the SSRI's effects on depression and anxiety may have to do with the class of SSRI medications tending to block a group of receptors in the brain or in the nervous system called nicotinic cholinergic receptors. There are two groups of cholinergic receptors and cholinergic, the cholinergic receptors as well as their hormone acetylcholine are very crucial to memory formation in the brain. One group of the receptors, they respond to a nicotine. They're called nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Those are the ones we're talking about. There's another group called muscarinic cholinergic receptors. So in terms of the nicotinic cholinergic receptors, it seems that most of the SSRIs, uh, including the one that I use, fluvoxamine, non-competitively bind to a, a lot of nicotinic cholinergic receptors, not all of them. They competitively bind to one group of them, actually, which is the A, uh, sorry, the alpha 9, alpha 10 subgroup of nicotinic cholinergic receptors, but these ones mostly exist in the periphery, uh, in the immune-related periphery of our uh, system and not in the brain. So they non-competitively bind to these nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Uh, fluoxetine, Prozac, is the most potent at this. 
Now, they don't inhibit all of them that much. So, for example, the alpha-4, beta-2 nicotinic receptors only seem to be inhibited, uh, they made an estimation, by about 2.5% in the body when taking flu fluoxetine, Prozac, at the normal levels. So, they're not major inhibition of these nicotinic receptors. Moreover, and this is why I don't fully buy into this idea, personally, moreover, there's some interesting elements of the interactivity between nicotine and SSRIs. So, for example, um, nicotine causes a, a elevation in serotonin in the free frontal cortex for 15 minutes after nicotine's administration in rodents. If you give a rodent fluoxetine, Prozac, beforehand, the uh, increase in elevation in serotonin in the free frontal cortex extends from 15 minutes to 2 hours. So there's a synergistic effect from nicotine, or let's not say synergistic, let's say SSRIs amplify nicotine's effects on serotonin. Okay, there's that. Then we also know that, uh, for example, serotonin's effects on, uh, sorry, nicotine's effects on serotonin depend on the subunits of the nicotinic cholinergic system that include alpha-7 receptors, which I've discussed in my cholinergic series, by the way, guys. And they, these receptors seem particularly important to cognition. Finally, uh, uh, this, is, this is where it gets really interesting. So when you give acute administration of nicotine to rodents, in the tail suspension test, which is a common measure of antidepressant effects in rodents, you don't see a difference in the tail suspension of the rodents from nicotine alone. If you give them escitalopram, which is a SSRI, you see a minor change in the tail suspension test. If you give them both nicotine and escitalopram, you get a major change, a significant change in the antidepressant effects in rodents. Interestingly, inhibiting one group of nicotinic cholinergic receptors while you do this can increase the antidepressant effect. So what this means to say is that there is a synergistic effect between agonizing nicotinic cholinergic receptors and taking an SSRI. But some of the nicotinic cholinergic receptors appear to be, the, it appears to be the case that if you block some of them, you get, may get an even more antidepressant effect. So it seems to be the case that if you had a selective nicotinic cholinergic receptor modulator, you could optimize the effects of SSRIs potentially. Um, but anyway, it's a little bit unclear. Nonetheless, it was a very informative paper. For you guys to know, there's often different hypotheses coming about of the ways that antidepressants work. So in, th in this paper, actually, they called upon, I don't know if I mentioned this, but they called upon what's called the cholinergic-adrenergic hypothesis of depression, which is different than the monoamine hypothesis of depression that relies on serotonin, or the serotonin hypothesis of depression that's exclusive to serotonin. In this uh, theory of depression, Basically what happens is there's a uh, reduction in noradrenergic signaling and a compensatory increase in cholinergic signaling. And the theory is this compensatory increase in cholinergic signaling causes depression. Uh, it is true, I've seen it in my own case and other people, if you have too much cholinergic signaling, and obviously uh, acetylcholine can be a neurotoxin as well. If you have too much cholinergic signaling, you can develop anxiety and depression and stuff like that. But I really don't believe in this hypothesis of depression being a uh, complete paradigm for all depressives, like it's all a noradrenergic cholinergic thing. I think probably it's more complicated than that. And I also think that probably it's not clear that the SSRI's blockade of nicotinic cholinergic receptors is always good because nicotine can synergistically improve the effects of SSRIs. Anyway, guys, sorry for being a little long-winded. I wish you guys a wonderful day and I'll see you next time with another episode of BioNews.